systems and questions that are at play in this field. And I was wondering if um, any of you wanted to comment on sort of overarching themes or um, sort of fundamental principles of microbial communities that are arising from some of these studies that might be relevant for uh, many of us, regardless of what the particular system is we're studying. Um, I don't know if Jill, you want to start, and then we can go down. Well, this is on, yeah. I think in general it's really important to study across systems from human gut to acid mind drainage to whatever to look for cross-cutting principles of ecology and organization, finding the commonalities. And actually I'm really interested to know actually if your um, archaea are the same ones we're seeing in the subsurface because I think that that's a, a place where we might see sort of convergence of geochemistry and, and process. Eric, you want to you know, I think uh, uh, looking at a lot of different systems is uh, going to be a great way, uh, really kind of an opportunity that we have in these microbial systems where we can get the high throughput data in a way that uh, sort of macro ecologists uh, almost can't. So, so I think uh, by looking at a lot of different systems, we can really attack basic questions in theoretical ecology about community assembly and things like that. I, I guess with, with the caveat that, you know, we'll, then there'll be a burden of proof to show that it really applies to, you know, bigger systems, but. Um, so I was going to add that um, I think one of the, the fundamental challenges that we face is, is how to really integrate across all of these data sets, right? And so I think this is well worked out for model ecosystems where you may have a genetic system and you can go to, you know, the I don't know, the uh, C. elegans database, and you know every single gene has had an umpteenth million you know, curated experiments associated with it. Uh, in the microbial world, this is uh, still few and far between, and, and we're generating a lot of data, and I think we know what to do with the um, metagenomics and maybe transcriptomics side of things, but the proteomic data, the imaging data, um, finding ways that we can integrate all of this in a meaningful way to, to really do systems biology, I think, um, is, is sort of the grand challenge going forward, so. Well, working in pelagic systems, uh, there's never a dull day. Every drop of seawater seems uh, new, but really the challenge is uh, how to learn uh, some principles uh, of uh, um, ecosystem uh, function and dynamics of working with uh, the right size systems, and then learning from there how to uh, then extrapolate it to the larger systems. So there must be ecological uh, principles of interactions that we can discover that uh, in macroecology may not be the same as in mic microbial ecology. Um, and may also have applications to other systems, like, uh, I mean, at least that's my gut feeling, that, uh, uh, that you know, where you can, you can see the, the ocean water that you cannot uh, in some of the systems. But, uh, yeah, going from small systems where you can have a greater resolution, uh, learn principles and go to bigger systems. Uh, Okay, excellent. So yeah, uh, maybe we can start with questions from the audience. Uh, Lee, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I think, uh, Eric, a really interesting question is how much our genes influence our gut microbiome. So the question is, as you looked at different individuals, you could see unique <coughs> signatures. What if you looked at identical twins? Yeah, so uh, so that's a really interesting question, um, and it's it's a question that I've always been fascinated by. I've been you know uh, uh, spent a lot of time you know knocking on a lot of doors saying, hey, we really need to do a like GWAS microbiome study and, and see what's going on. So now I've been you know part of uh, of a couple of these and. Um, <laughs> it's uh, so you know it's kind of like still early stages, but it, it's been a little uh, uh, disappointing uh, in that uh, uh, I've heard that you know I think Ruth Lay may have tracked down like one gene that uh, that has an effect on the microbiome. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of uh, immunochip data because because we thought that would be a good way to go. So this is you know like five hundred thousand uh, 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 SNPs across. Uh, Genes involved in the immune system, because you know, the, just what we thought would be, you know, most likely to to yield something. And with a couple hundred uh, patients, 
uh, we still haven't seen anything that rises above multiple hypothesis testing, which is not to say there's not some weak effects there, but there's, uh, it's not as strong as, uh, as expected. But the, um, the twin data is, is really interesting because what we know is that, uh, so we've done twin uh, studies and other folks have done twin studies. Uh, there's certainly a twin effect. Uh, there's not a discernible difference between monozygotic and dizygotic, which uh, might suggest, hey, maybe it's environment rather than genetics. Um, and there's a very strong difference between uh, mother and twin uh, is, is much weaker than um, uh, a dizygotic uh, a twin and, and, and the other twin. So there you've got roughly the same amount of shared genetics, but a real difference. And, and I think when you put all these data together with, with some other data that, uh, you know, that I haven't really talked about, um, we're, we're seeing a picture where uh, because the, the gut microbiome is so stable, you know, until you get food poisoning or something, um, over years and years and years, and it's actually, we've tracked it down, it's really exactly the same strain that's, uh, that's stable on, on, on repeat visits. Um, that uh, uh, this gut microbiome may be established very early in life, and mine was reestablished after salmonella, and then it's probably programmed into, uh, into the immune system. But at least that's my intuition of, of, of what's keeping it uh, 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 there. So uh, that kind of, uh, uh, the stochastic effects, right, where all of my firmicutes can disappear and they get replaced by all new firmicutes in like a day, uh, says that, uh, you know, those weren't the optimal set of species for my gut because w what are the odds that I ran into them the day I recovered from salmonella? They were just good enough and they got programmed into the, to the immune system. So, so I think there's not as much uh, influence between uh, the, the genetics and the microbiome as, uh, as I had once hoped. But I, there, probably, there, there certainly is, uh, there must be some, okay. Hey, you know, a really interesting experiment would be to take two identical twins knock out their gut microbiome and see how they recover. See, you might be able to see genetics better. Well, we, we're doing it in mice. Do it in we're doing China. it in mice. You do okay. it in China. <laughs> we'll start with mice. It'll be easier to clear the IRB. Lee, and I guess I, I, if I could just add to that last point, the, uh, not necessarily the germ-free person point, but the, um, although the, the studies in humans are much less clear, there's been some really elegant studies done in large um, mouse cross experiments where they take outbred mouse lines, breed them together for many generations, and then compare genotypic diversity in the host to the structure of their microbial community. And the benefit there is that you can really control environmental factors that conflict a lot of the human studies. And so there they have been able to link many different polymorphisms throughout the genome with the structure of the community. Many of those make sense based on being found in uh, elements of innate immunity and adaptive immunity, but some of them fall in genes that are not easily explainable by, by how we understand uh, the host communicating with the microbiota. So. But, but Peter, mice have got a totally different innate immune system from Homo sapiens. It's got a different number of toll-like receptors. How can you say that they have innate immunity, adaptive immunity, such as you just said? There is a huge difference between data taken in mice and data taken in men. And your own data of the transfer of obesity has not been replicated in man yet. Anyway. I'm Trevor Marshall, incidentally. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to ask Eric Good luck with that IRB, too. Sorry? Say so good luck with that IRB as well. Yeah, yeah. Actually, well, I don't want to... You guys can get an institute going in China with that. There are actually people doing uh, the transplant experiments in humans, um, yeah, but I don't want to talk to their last, results. Last month yeah. the, uh, at the Matterhead conference, yeah. uh, it was discussed. <laughs> Your name actually came up. Uh, but uh, Eric, I want to ask because there were some very interesting slides you gave on, on the yogurt. And once again, uh, I was in Paris uh, last month for the Medihit conference, and Danone, uh, the, the yogurt maker, has been very big in Medihit. And yet, um, the speakers from Danone and the speakers from Medihit had been unable to find any benefit uh, for yogurt and uh, in humans. So I wondered which of those slides that you showed us um, were related to human results and which were related to dogs and, and mice. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's all work done in mice, except for the, uh, the first slide, which was that New England Journal of Medicine paper, um, you know, which was just sort of an epidemiological study. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks. 
So, so that's you know, I mean, in the mice, the uh, the body weight is the strongest phenotype we see. There's a whole bunch of other phenotypes, but the the body weight is sort of the most obvious. So, I'm pretty optimistic, given that uh, uh, you know that does seem to transfer to humans, at least as far as uh, that uh, you know correlation data from the uh, you know from from from, from that paper suggests. Uh, you know, I've actually talked to Dan Owen and. Um, uh, they said, you know, this is really interesting uh, research, but, uh, you know, our research program is focused on the effect of uh, yogurt and probiotics on GI health and uh, immune system uh, function. And so they're like, you know, you're doing system level whole body stuff that's, that's not really... You know, it doesn't really integrate with, with the type of stuff that we're, that we're interested wound in. So. Uh, wound healing is the immune system. So, yeah. I mean, if they are looking at immune uh, dysfunction, I'm not dis dis yeah, dis yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've talked to Dan Owen, and, and uh, you know, it seems like they're they're on a sort of different uh, uh, research path. So, so maybe they, you know, haven't really done a lot of uh, uh, the same type of, okay. of work. I don't know. I'm I'm optimistic for for well, uh, it works humans. In humans, I'll try. It, believe me. <laughs> I certainly eat a lot of yogurt every day. Okay, so we can do. Uh, so I have two questions, one for Victoria, one for, uh, one for uh, Joe. Um, Victoria, you mentioned that you could see aggregates and the single cells in the community. And so if they actually benefit from each other in aggregates, why would you expect to be able to see single cells? So do you think because of environmental heterogeneity, so why do you think there will be such different yeah. outcomes if actually co-aggregating gives you fitness benefit? Yeah, so I, I think that's a great question. Um, so part of it... Uh, I think is is natural. So the NME1 cells, those long filamentous ones, frequently are found on their own, um, and they tend to live deeper uh, in the sediment. And the other component of this is is possibly artifacts in in processing, right? And so you might be actually disrupting in the the course of collecting and. Uh, um, doing the, the hybridization procedure, and we have some data actually with with some of the sulfate reducing partners that don't attach quite as as rigorously. Um, that we think that maybe some of them are sloughing off um, in inflation. So, so it's a it's a hard problem, right? I mean, these are very remote environments, and uh, there's a certain amount of handling that has to happen. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah. And then for, um, for Joe, I'm, I'm really amazed that you can assemble right from 0.2% abundance of microbes. But I have a, a different question. So why do you think the distribution looks so different from um, the uh, abundance distribution from other communities? Right? Why are they all, there's no like very abundant species? So, so one explanation could be they are actually all cooperating. So if in, individuals are cooperating, the ratios converge to a steady level. So how, um, how do you think... Uh, how much cooperation do you think is there? Or do you think there's actually another reason why they are present all at a very low abundance for many, many of these species? Okay, there's lots of great questions. I think that the systems we've looked at from the perspective of rank abundance, this is definitely at the flat end, even in abundance. Um, you know, for example, acid mine drainage, you might get 40% of the dominant. You look at ocean, sometimes 4%. I think some of the gut studies, 4% is the most abundant. So this is, yeah, you're right. It's an order of magnitude down. I think that there are a lot of factors at play here. And I do think that cooperation and interdependence is really important in the system. One thing I didn't point out is that we have no recognizable pathways for biosynthesis of most of the amino acids in some of these organisms. Yeah. Um, I think it's also a heterogeneous environment in terms of the resources. I mean, in terms of the organic carbon compounds, there's a lot of the refractory materials. And I think that that resource diversity probably gives you um, a component of, of background diversity. Um, so I think that, that, that besides these are very, very novel organisms and they've been down there a long time and, and, and yeah. Uh, this, this question is for uh, Eric. There's some evidence that uh, a history of infectious enteritis is a predictor of future development of IBD. So my question was, in your time series data, did you see any evidence of persistence of, of changes in the microbiota, or was everything just totally reversible after the episodes of infectious, uh, you know, salmonella or, or whatever? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so, so what happened is I, I don't know if this is your question, but what happened is uh, like 30 to 40 percent of the species that were there uh, went uh, completely extinct and never came back. And they were they were replaced with new species, which were then uh, stable for for the rest of the study. So so the species that replaced them are now the 
uh, you know, the, the, the permanent residence. Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah, just could you say anything more about what, you did mention though, say with Firmicutes, you would eliminate all of them and then the next day, you know, they'd be back. So what was the difference? Maybe you could explain, you know, could you speak more to the difference between the irreversible versus reversible changes? Oh, well, the, the reversible changes, um, those were when uh, my student went to Thailand. So that was sort of the, the geographic effect. And, and you know, he, he picked up some pathogens there and, and um, uh, you know, was, was an insult to his uh, GI microbes, but maybe not to the same extent that the food poisoning was. So, so he recovered. Um, you know, it came uh, sort of back to back to normal, but uh, but I didn't, and it was probably just a, a you know a, a stronger effect. I, I don't know. It's something we're we're really interested in because if you could uh, uh, mimic that effect and and reprogram how the gut uh, decides to tolerate or not uh, its 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 resident microbes, you know, maybe you could use that as a treatment for. Um, you know, maybe you could hijack that system to, you know, convince the, the immune system to start, you know, tolerating some things in, in, in the host that, that it might not be. I don't know. It's, it's something we're really interested in, and, and we have really no idea how it works at this point. So a question for all of you, I guess. Um, in each of your fields, uh, what are the major factors influencing relative species abundance and specifically, how much does abundance of other species affect the prevalence of any given species? Or is that a type of interaction common or not important? <laughs> well, I, I can start, I guess. Um, I'm not sure what my field is. So, you know, <laughs> I think I lost track of that concept a long time ago. Um, so we work a lot, across a lot of different systems, including human gut, actually. I think that species richness is not determined by extreme environments. This is a, a misunderstanding, I think, that's been perpetuated a lot um, in the literature and in people's common everyday thinking. I think that's much more to do with resource diversity is a very important factor, I suspect. Um, I think there's lots of other things that come into play. I'm going to be able to give you a comprehensive list off the top of my head, but absolutely, I think these interactions and exchanges and tight couplings and all the thermodynamic and, and um, kinetic effects that go with that are um, <coughs> inherent in terms of determining the community structure and, and, and organization. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the major challenges, I think, in theoretical ecology. How do you maintain diversity? Uh, one easy way to do it is that everybody's using completely different and non-overlapping resources. Uh, so, so, so that certainly works, right? If everybody's using the same or largely overlapping resources, um, I mean, you, you, you can't really maintain diversity permanently by, uh, you know, some complicated set of interactions between species that, you know, it, it, the math doesn't work out, okay? Um, so how, to what extent, you know, uh, everybody's just using totally non-overlapping resources or there's competition and things are always migrating in, but they're also going extinct, sort of like, you know, neutral theory of biodiversity type stuff, uh, I, I don't think is, is well understood. You know, you can find papers arguing for and, and, and against it. And I think as uh, microbial ecologists, with all the tools that we have uh, kind of in our toolkit right now, uh, you know, we can start to address uh, some of these basic questions, at least in microbial systems. Yeah, so um, great session. Uh, I had a relative, uh, little bit of a detailed kind of question for Jill. Uh, so uh, in your talk, you showed these self-organizing maps uh, that were going through sequence space. And one of the things I noticed on the first one that you popped up was there was a lot of kind of a recurring motif I saw, of sort of two ovals and like a little tail off. And I saw this motif occurring repeatedly. And I was wondering if you could maybe comment on sort of the meaning of the, of you know, of shapes that you see repeatedly in sequence space. Are these different genes that have sort of similar evolutionary um, patterns or, or, or things like that? I'm wondering if you've, if you've thought about that or looked at it. First of all, the clusters represent um, collections of sequence fragments, not individual genes, because the length of the piece that we're actually putting into the map is typically 5 kb to build the structure. And the expected and, and, and happy outcomes we get rings of some shape. I'm not sure that the detailed shape really matters, but just basically a structure in the map, which is a projection that basically says these things are more similar to each other than they are to other things. Um, sometimes we'll get very, very distinct. I guess I saw certain patterns of the rings that looked... Yeah. 
I'm not too, I, I, a number of cases. I, I think I'd be careful in tipping too much into right. that. I was going to say that the height of the boundary differs, and sometimes we get very tight, well-defined rings, and those are actually often plasmids and phage. So there are certain kinds of elements that go into the map that have sort of distinctive structure. Thank you. Uh, Carrie Harwood, uh, University of Washington. Um, it seems like a difference between the gut environment and your other environments is that um, in the more nutrient poor environments, you have the bet, the microbes are going to have are surviving for really long periods of time with really not growing at all without growing at all. And it, it seems like this is a property that has to be within the organism. It doesn't seem like something they can share between each other. And I wondered if, if you could tell me what your thoughts are on this and if you think it would be possible to tease out of the data sets <laughs> yeah. genes that might be important for these really long-term periods survival. of starvation? That's a wonderful question. Um, yeah, so I sort of alluded to the fact that a lot of life in the, the deep subsurface, sort of, they call it life in the slow lane, right? There's, so there's a lot of abundance of, of intact cells down there, but they're, they're metabolizing and dividing maybe once every thousand years is some of, are some of the predictions, right? But they're, they're persisting. And, and in our particular environment, so we're, we're looking at the um, the better end of the energy spectrum is in terms of uh, methane oxidation uh, because there's, there's such a high flux of methane, so there's a lot of food to feed these, these consortia. Um, and in this particular system, so I, I just breezed through the last two slides, and so we've gotten very interested in the um, intracellular inclusions and in energy storage and, and nutrient demands of, of these organisms and so we're, we're, um, just it's just early days so we haven't been able to tease apart um, any rigorous uh, correlations but it, it looks like um, things like phos uh, polyphosphates and uh, carbon storage compounds and things like that um, have a spatial predictability in terms of how much a cell is, is storing and its distance from its nearest neighbor and the outside environment. So there may be tricks that they can do in terms of uh, building up enough to, to, to make ATP to restart the process um, in times where, where things get, get lean. So um, in terms of genes, um, there's no spoilation or any anything like that we haven't seen. There's a lot of um, oxidative stress type of genes that we see, but it's it's hard to pinpoint one specific um, adaptation, but certainly something worth looking at. Sure. Maybe we have time for one more question? Mm -hmm. Or two more? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Eric, uh, I was uh, just curious about what might be known of a correlating skin microbiome with the gut. For example, I wouldn't expect when you had the uh, salmonella incident that you would have uh, necessarily wanted to do extra things, but uh, it seems to me it, it must uh, the skin must be affected as well. Uh, I, I mean, you're standing next to Julia, who probably has a much better answer than I do. Uh, uh, you know, we've looked at sort of correlations across all the body sites, uh, and I don't know in you know, uh, particular about uh, skin, but within uh, a given person, you can definitely detect um, uh, an, an excess of sort of unique uh, OTUs that are unique to one person. Um, you can find them on different body sites, and, and uh, almost all you know, pairwise, all the body sites in the Human Microbiome Project, you can find some excess of, of sharing of bugs uh, within the same person. Uh, I, I don't know, Julia, do you want to comment on the rate or extent of that or what's known? Because it's kind of outside my... Yeah, well, especially what I mean is in response to... Right. I mean, I, I don't know that... I mean, so maybe actually David will talk about that even this afternoon. I mean, in terms of... <laughs> all right, all right, David, I know, get, the, the ball's in your court now. <laughs> but just in terms of, it seems the issue is when you take antibiotics and you, you know, the extent to which you are shifting many microbiomes and then how they may come and recover at different rates. I mean, I think that 
what we're thinking about is, is not just the similarity of the different body site microbiomes, but how they may be directly and indirectly communicating with each other, either as microbes or as metabolites. I promise my question will be quick. Mostly for Eric. Um, given cost issues and so forth, and obviously the long-term stability of the, of the gut flora, but it also shows uh, potentially illness, uh, how long until I, that becomes part of an annual physical? When will I be getting my gut uh, flora <laughs> profiled as, as part of a yearly physical? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a good question. Uh, it's, getting, uh, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to do it. Um, uh, I don't know that uh, uh, I would necessarily uh, recommend that we spend a lot of money on it right now because you can see, you know, except for these very uh, dramatic effects, you know, like the foreign travel and getting sick, uh, there, there weren't huge changes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, yes, we could, uh, we could tell the difference between a healthy gut and inflammatory bowel disease, right? But that's, uh, I mean, you know, that's a, that's a, if we couldn't do that, then, you know, then, then what could we do, right? Uh, so, um, I don't know. I, I don't know that there's a lot of uh, uh, cause for it at the at the moment because you know I think largely the uh, the gut is very very stable over over time. So you're not going to get a lot of nuanced uh, uh, day to day data out of it. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm too pessimistic. But. Well, maybe it's a ten year thing, right? Where you might yeah. Get it done, yeah. and then, then if you're ill, they could you could see something. Potential. Yeah, it might be interesting to get a baseline and then see if it's changed. You know. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, let's thank our speakers and. Thank you.